From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Jim Morris, Johnny. You working on a case? Found at Kentucky, yes, but not insurance. Good. Will you go out to the West Coast for us? Maybe. What is it? Murder, marine theft, arson, or something new? It's nothing yet. Our manager in Los Angeles phoned this morning. A woman out there wants to buy a $200,000 policy on her life. Well? Oh, it's not that we don't want the business, but the sales agent doesn't want to take the responsibility of a deal that size. He thinks she's holding something back. We've decided to investigate. How old is she? I don't know. Why? I thought I'd ask. There's one kind of woman to investigate, you know, and then there's another. When do you want me to leave? Edmund O'Brien, in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Great Eastern Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nora Faulkner matter. Expense account item one, $220 airfare and incidentals between Hartford and the Great East Building, Miracle Mile, Wilshire Boulevard, Los Angeles. The only apparent miracle was the fact that pedestrians crossed Wilshire constantly without getting killed. Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Dollar. That's all right. Let's see. Now that Tracy Faulkner. That's what? Right. Thanks. Mm. 200000 to go to her husband. How did it start, Mr. Snyder? She phoned one of our salesmen, a fellow by the name of Nelson. He went out to her house. The uh, address is there. And she told him what she wanted. He says he was counting his commission at first, but after he filled out the application, he began to wonder. About what? Her. She told him she planned on paying six months premium and wanted to know how soon the policy would be in effect. Acted unnatural, as he put it. I think we ought to find out about her. I don't like this kind of thing. It's a blind search. I don't even know what I'm looking for. But I'll start on it in the morning, and I'll let you know how I come out. Expense account item two, three dollars cab fare. The usual way to start an investigation of this type is with the subject's neighbors. From the male faction, I learned that Nora Faulkner was beautiful and obviously above reproach. The female faction reversed that decision and reported that she lived with her husband and his mother but hadn't been seen for the past few days. Realizing that mothers-in-law are fair sources of information, I put her next on my list. Mrs. Faulkner, the elder, sported short, iron-gray hair, and her face told the story of an endless battle to hang on to youth. Come into the drawing room, Mr. Dollar. I think we could be comfortable there. Thank you. I'll close the doors. You could see by the way that maid was eyeing you that she's an incurable prior. I didn't notice. She's impossible. Well, what did you find out? Who is she seeing in Las Vegas? I beg your pardon? Nora, what did you learn? I'm her mother-in-law. Oh, yes, I know that, but maybe you have me confused with someone else. You want the detective? The maid announced you as an investigator. I'm an insurance investigator, Mrs. Faulkner. Well, then, you're not from that agency. Oh, well, this is embarrassing, to say the least. I, I hope you won't mention it to anyone. Well, it's none of my business. Oh, it's really nothing. It's a, it's a little game I play with Nora, and I tease her about her little trips. Please sit down, Mr. Uh... Dollar. Uh, of course. I feel so foolish, but my daughter-in-law was mentioned when you came in, wasn't she? Yes, I did want to talk to you about her. To be quite honest, the company that hired me is a little uneasy about that $200,000 life insurance policy she applied for. Nora applied? Yes. You didn't know about her? No, I didn't. Of course, she never tells me anything. Why would she do a thing like that? She's a clever woman. There must be a reason. Who's the beneficiary, Mr. Dollar? Your son, Andrew. I see. Then I would say it's one of her unexplainable maneuvers, an attempt to regain Andrew's trust and affection. That's an odd thing to say. Nora's a strange woman. I know her better than anyone else does. 
Yes, better by far than my son, her husband. I understand how she rushed him into marriage while he was in a highly emotional state after he'd been inducted into the army. He was just 19. That was in 1942. I know the gay life she led while he was living in foxholes overseas and while he was convalescing here after the war. Mrs. Faulkner, I realize that all these things seem very important to you, but... Mother, I... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had company. Come along, Andrew. You were told that I had company, and you know it. This is Mr. Dollar, Andrew, from an insurance company. How do you do, Mr. Faulkner? Andrew, why do you keep things from me? What do you mean? Mr. Dollar is from an insurance company. Surely you know what I mean? No, I don't. Nora's new insurance policy. Why don't you explain what you're talking about, Mother? Nora applied for a $200,000 life insurance policy. You are to be the beneficiary. Didn't she tell you? She hasn't said anything about it yet. Of course she hasn't. There are a number of things she hasn't told you. I warned you before. Mother? Now, don't be angry with me, Andrew. Then please leave. As you wish, Andrew. You know that everything I do is or say is for you. Then leave. All right, Mother. Laura. Please control your temper. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Faulkner. So am I. Is it true about the policy? About the application, yes. I don't understand it. I don't understand Nora. I never know what she's thinking. I blame it on Mother, her prying and suspicion. I blame it on that star woman. Who? Nora doesn't think for herself anymore. She doesn't do anything or go anyplace unless this, this dame tells her to. Who's this? Oh, a spook, psychic, uh, Madame Star. That's where this insurance idea came from. <laughs> for a price, she'll tell you if Nora's a good risk or not. Where can I find it? Out toward Inglewood someplace. She runs a classified ad in all the evening papers. Thanks. I'm sorry to have caused you this. I, I really am. Oh, well, it's not your fault. <laughs> Whose fault is it? Maybe everybody's. It was obvious after meeting Andrew Faulkner and his mother that the application for the policy wasn't the only unusual element in the matter. But on instruction from the company's Los Angeles manager, I continued my investigation. Expense account item 3, 450, transportation to the address of Madam Star, a one-story frame house with heavily draped windows and a sign outside that advertised advice. Good afternoon, sir. Madam Star? That is right. May I come in? All are welcome here. This can't be classed as one of your regular consultations, but I'll pay you for your time. That is generous of you. What advice do you wish? I'd like to know why Nora Faulkner was so anxious to buy a big policy on her life. Who are you? You mean you don't know? I claim no powers as medium. I'm not psychic. I only offer advice. Some of those who listen are helped. What advice do you want? I told you. Nora Faulkner has been coming here? She has. She's in great need of advice. More intelligent advice than I could give, perhaps. But I try to help her. By telling her to buy insurance? Nora Faulkner's life these last few years has been lived under severe mental strain. I advise the search for inner truth, among other things. Yeah. What about the insurance policy? A mental torment resulted in physical failings. I advise tonics, vitamins. Why are you evading the insurance? She wanted a more tangible protection of her life. Protection? She felt it in danger. Why? I have said enough. She's in Las Vegas, I understand. Where's she staying? You go there? I don't seem to be able to get anything but double talk here. Everybody has a reason for caution. There is Flamingo Hotel. She's there. How much do I owe you? Nothing. I've given you no advice. What I would advise, I have no right to say. Good afternoon, sir. Well, I suppose you have to be mysterious. Good afternoon, sir. Expense account item four, 450, return trip to my hotel. Item 5, 370, cab fare to an airport in Burbank. And item 6, $19.90, round trip to Las Vegas by way of Western Airlines excursion coach.
My seatmate turned out to be not only a tourist consultant, but a whip. Your first trip to Las Vegas? No, I've spent a little time there. Great town. Greatest resort I've ever seen. You like to fish? Well, I used to. I don't have much time for it now. I'm always going to start again. You know how it is. But start on Lake Mead, believe me. Why, they got bass in that lake. Now, look, the last time I was there, two of us went out. I'd broken my rod. It's nothing but a stump. But I put a paper clip on the end Excuse and... Excuse bait... what is your name? Huh? Oh, Esmond. Harry Esmond. Thank you. And your name, sir? Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Thank you. <laughs> Dollar! Yeah, and I know what's coming. <laughs> name like that, a place like Las Vegas, you might be going in the right direction, brother. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> Except for Mr. Harry Esmond, it was a smooth trip. We eased onto the big desert strip, boarded waiting limousines, and ten minutes later I walked into the lobby of the Flamingo Hotel. Mr. Gostain, please. Long distance. Yes, sir. My name is Dollar. I have a reservation. Long distance. Oh, just a moment, please. Uh, yes, sir. Will you sign the register? All right. Um... You have a Mrs. Andrew Faulkner staying here, or Nora Faulkner? Nora Faulkner? Sheriff Wood. What's the trouble, son? Mr. Dollar just registered. He asked for Nora Faulkner. Oh, he did, huh? Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar. You may want to talk to her, but she don't want to talk to you or anybody else. She can't. What's the matter? She must have had her dinner outside the main dining room. She's in the hospital. She's been poisoned. Turn you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. But first, the show that dares to name names, dates, places, and the crimes involved. That's Gangbusters, which you hear every Saturday night on most of these same stations. Gangbusters has been hailed nationwide as a great anti-crime series. For the men who tell you how to smash crime are police chiefs, sheriffs, and other law enforcement officers from America's cities and towns. Each Saturday, Gangbusters brings you a new case taken from police files, showing you how a criminal was brought to justice. Often, the police officer who headed the chase narrates the story. Be listening for Gangbusters this evening and every Saturday evening on CBS, The Star's Address. Now, with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. After a look at my card and an explanation of my mission, Deputy Sheriff Wood told me the rest of what he knew about Mrs. Nora Faulkner's poisoning, which to date wasn't much. There was no proof of how she'd gotten the poison dose, and the last time he'd seen her, she'd been too ill to talk. She was under her care of a personal physician who had accompanied her from Los Angeles. By the time he had finished, we were at the emergency hospital and approaching her room. I went through the usual rigmarole of notifying next kin. Her husband wasn't in, but somebody said she was his mother and then fainted on the phone. Mm, she would. I expect her to be flying in here on her own wings any minute now. Is it? Yes? Oh, Sheriff. This man's an insurance investigator, Dr. Brooks. Meet Mr. Dollar. Hello. An insurance investigator? I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, I was looking into an insurance policy she wanted to buy. Oh, I see. How is she? Mm -hmm. Resting as comfortably as can be expected. Has she said anything about the poisoning? Yes, but I'd rather you heard it from her. Won't you come in? Thanks. After you, Sheriff? Sure, I'll take along. Make it look official and learn how you city boys operate. Who is it, Peter? These men want to talk to you, Nora. I want you to tell them exactly what you told me. Uh. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Please, Nora. All right. I couldn't stand it any longer. I didn't want to go on. I wanted to die. You took the poison, Mrs. Faulkner? Yes. Not because I'm a coward. Because there's nothing about life that I don't hate. I don't want any more of it. Where is the poison? I destroyed it. Destroyed it? Why should you do that? I don't know. How 
can you expect me to know why I did little things at a time like that? I don't know. Peter, please, I don't want to talk anymore. I don't want to talk anymore. I think we'd better let her rest. <laughs> I'm not sure her story rings true. How well do you know her, Doctor? Quite well, Mr. Dollar. She's been my patient for over two years. Her life's been very unhappy. You find it hard to believe that the poison was self-administered? Yes, I do. Why would she lie to protect someone who attempted to kill her? I don't know, but suicides don't do things like destroy poison. Or take it when they know room service is on the way up to their room with a meal. That's a downright waste of everybody's time. The waiter did find her, didn't he? I hadn't thought of it. Good Lord. What? The vitamin tonic she was taking. The dose included one before her evening meal. Tablet form or is it liquid? It's a liquid. Had a cold. And the poison could have gotten to her that way. Where is it? Back at the hotel in her room. Do you want it? I think it should be analyzed. I can get it up to the lab in Carson City tonight by plane. All right. I'll show it to you. I think she kept it in the medicine cabinet. I'll look. Yes, here it is. Oh, oh. The devil. What happened? Clumsy fool. Sorry, I dropped the bottle. The wash basin's a bad place to drop evidence, Doctor. Sheriff, can we save enough of this stuff? It's going to get out down the drain. Don't need much. I can scoop some up with my knife. I'll find something to put it in. An aspirin box would do. Here, I'll hold it. Watch that broken glass. I'm sorry, gentlemen. If the hatico does contain the poison, I imagine my position won't be better. But it was an accident. Neither the sheriff nor I reacted to that. We retrieved enough of the liquid to test us and went back to the lobby. Two men were waiting for us near the desk. I'll be stacking up, Woody. Well, we've got a real civilized mystery on our hands, Ned. Who's Mr. Dollar? Max Lewis and Ned Gilbert. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, These boys help run the place when it isn't running them. What happened to Mrs. Faulkner, Dollar? Well, she says she tried to kill herself, but the signs make it look like somebody might have slipped the stuff to her. Going to be all right? Mm, seems to be. We'll send her flowers in the morning, Max. Remind me. Yeah. I'll go get this tinned evidence on a plane, Dollar. See you in the morning. Fine, Sheriff. If the boys here will take care of you. If you aren't careful, that is. I'll see you later. <laughs> you pay for breakfast tomorrow morning. Thank you, Mr. Schiller. Mr. Schiller, please. Long distance. I'll get that phone call for Abe. He's taking a nap. Give Dollar everything he wants. That's it, Dollar. The place is yours. You want to start with a drink? That's the best suggestion today. Come on, there's a bar in the mural room. Ah, it's a good crowd. It's only ten. You won't really pile in until later. Sit down. I just soon stand. Thanks, I will. I'm beat. How are you, Mr. Lewis? Fine, Jim. Uh, make mine double, will you? Not much soda. The usual for you, Mr. Lewis? Yeah, and don't be good to me. I've got a long night. I got you. Ah, this is a beautiful spot. Who's quartet? Chewy Ray. He's at the piano. I hope you can come back for pleasure sometime. <laughs> so do I. Say, what do you know about this Nora Fork? Nothing. I've noticed her. I've seen her in the casino. <laughs> he seems to be the type you would notice. Did she gamble much? I don't know how much, but we can find out. Come on. There's Joe Rosenberg, our credit manager. He'll know. Hey, Max. This is Mr. Dollar, Joe. He's here looking into this Nora Faulkner business. He wants to know how much she gambled. Oh, sure. Now, I looked at the card right after I heard what happened. She signed to get a $500 check cash, so that's all she got. What do you mean, sign for it, Joe? That's our deal here. You put down what you think you're going to need, and that's all you can get. You don't want our customers getting hurt. Take you, for example. Keep them in cold, sober, and cash a check for 200 bucks. Then, a few hours later, with a flock under your belt and the 200 gone, you come back to me and say you've got to have another 200 because you're going to break the joint. But you don't get it because we want you to wake up just hungover, not bankrupt. And all she had was 500. Right. She's been here three days. She didn't look like she'd get into trouble over an amount like that. I guess not. But she was in trouble. That's the safest bet in the place. It began to look as though I was in the wrong place to find a motive for attempted murder. I talked to a dealer who remembered her, a bartender, and a couple of waitresses who linked her with Dr. Brooks, but none of their statements led to anything. And then, a little past midnight, Andrew Faulkner and his mother arrived. I met them just inside the main entrance. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I, 
I didn't expect to find you here. The insurance company wanted me to follow it through. What has happened, Mr. Dollar? Your wife will recover. Oh, but they, they told me on the she phone. She was discovered in time, and they got her to a hospital. Oh, uh, I'm so relieved. We haven't been friendly, but when they called, I, I can't tell you how shocked I was. You've seen her? Yes, I've seen her, but you won't be able to until morning. What did she say? How does she explain this? She said she hated life and didn't want any more of it. I see. I suppose she mentioned me. Well, she didn't mention anybody. Not even her doctor? He was with her. Yes, I should imagine he would be. Well, I, I am relieved. Scandal and difficult decisions to come, notwithstanding. What is your room number, Andrew, dear? 302. Uh, and I'm in 117. In case you need us for anything, Mr. Dollar. I don't think I will, Mrs. Faulkner. I'll probably see you in the morning. And uh, I hope you have a good rest. <laughs> It was 2 in the a.m. when I went to my room. In spite of a number of rye and sodas and an exhausting day, it took a shower and some deep inhalations of desert air before I began to unbend. I propped myself up in bed with a magazine and was almost asleep when my phone rang. Johnny Dollar. The long arm of justice, Dollar. Oh, yeah, Sheriff. I'm back at the hospital. There's been more trouble. The Faulkner girl's been shot. Shot? Is she alive? Not quite half alive, I'd say. They're trying to bring her around now. Well, I'll see if we can get a statement. I want you to come over. Sure, I'll be right there. She's gone, Dollar. Uh, is that all? She was conscious for a minute or so. She named her husband. How did it happen? He wouldn't have if it wasn't for that personal physician of hers. He'd been in the hospital room tonight. The light was on. He went out to get some coffee, he says, and the husband came in. Where's Dr. Brooks now? In her room. Might as well hear what he has to say. Uh, Faulkner went through the window there, getting out. Bad night, doctor. Yes, a bad night. Sheriff would tell you. I want for him to hear it from you. He wants the insurance angle. All I want is to kill him. Well, he threatened to kill her and said nobody would suspect him because he loved her. And she wanted insurance to set up a motive. She hoped to frighten him, to make him think that people would suspect that he killed her for that. Why didn't you tell us these things? I didn't know. She told me the truth after I'd come back from the hotel. I told her you were sending the Hedicle to the laboratory. She said she didn't want to press, that it wasn't his fault, that his mother had driven him to it, that she wanted to give him another chance. And he had that chance. How did he arrange it? I saw him in the morning in Los Angeles. He'd have to be here. She said he was for a short time, in the afternoon. Then he flew back. A detective had found out that I was here with her. And that was Mother's work, too. He evidently arranged the poison when she refused to go home with him. He was deranged, a war casualty. Nora was terrified of him, but still she defended him. She's dead because she had a blind hope that the poison attempt would do something to him, that, that he'd get better and understand what his mother was... I'm sorry, gentlemen. Yeah, you should be, Doc. If you'd phoned us when you got her story, she wouldn't be dead. But I didn't know. I've had enough, Sheriff. I didn't know he'd come back. I'm going back to the hotel. I've got the airport covered. I'll call out some more men. We'll pick him up. Why don't you meet me in my office in 20 minutes? This kind of thing, I'll leave to you outsiders. We haven't had much experience with this stuff. Did you talk to the mother? Yeah, I talked to her. She admitted a lot of lies. She wanted to get the girl away from her son, but couldn't understand how he could have done this. Well, how do we find him? We sit here and wait. Las Vegas is a bad place to get away from. There's one highway in and one highway out, and I've got roadblocks on both. No other roads? Oh, there's some roads. But this is the desert. He can try them, but he'll find out that roads are like everything else on the desert. They go so far, and then they get tired and stop because they ain't getting anyplace. And we wait for a radio report. It might take some time, but it'll come. A lot of things to fight out here. Outside of town, couldn't get a drink for a thousand dollars. It's so dry. One old timer they tell about got hit by a drop of water, and they had to pour a bucket full of sand in his face to bring him to. <laughs> what time is it? 7.30 a.m. Even today, that sun's going to be hot enough to fry a steak. 
If he don't come back, it'll be because he can't make it. Oh, come on, stop it, will you? You know, they tell about a coyote chasing a jackrabbit. The coyote was starving to death, and the jackrabbit knew it, but it was so hot they were both walking. Sure, sure, sure. By, by noon, this killer of yours will be willing to crawl into the electric chair to cool off. I didn't believe him until just afternoon. Then the report was not by way of radio. We got a phone call from the railroad section house southwest of town. A stranger fitting our description had been seen. Hello, Sheriff. Hi, Ben. Where is this thing you talk about? Well, my kids sneaked up on him. They tell me he went into a drain culvert under the tracks miled down. You want to help? No, thanks. They say he's got a gun. A couple of you men cover the other side of the tracks. Okay, now, that first wash feeds into the culvert. We'll stay next to the embankment. This is close enough for now. You give him a yell. He may remember you. I'm trying. Faulkner, this is Dollar. Come on out, Faulkner. Uh, he's off his nut, Sheriff. I don't think he's coming out. Yeah, well, you keep yelling. I'm going to move over there where I can get a sight into that pipe. Maybe that'll change his mind. Faulkner, come on out. There are men on each side of the track. There's no place for you to go. Sheriff? I'm all right. Come on out of there, Faulkner. I don't want to blow you out, but if you don't put down your gun and come out on your own, I'll have to. All right. Okay, boys, stand clear on the other side of the track. You don't expect an answer, do you, Sheriff? No, guess not. Poor cuss. Who carried his life insurance, you know? Expense account item five, miscellaneous, $200. Item six, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total... $1,120.40. Remarks? Mrs. Faulkner collapsed when she received the news. She hadn't recovered by the time I left, and I was glad. Glad I didn't have to face her again. Her son was guilty in fact, and I'd seen him killed because of it. That was bad enough. But not as bad, I thought, as watching her start life again, alone and knowing that the guilt was really hers. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Parley Bear, Jeanette Nolan, Herb Butterfield, Lee Patrick, John Daner, Tim Graham, Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Victor Perrin, and Clayton Post. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Edmund O'Brien as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Are you ready to sing it again tonight? You'll find a whole hour full of the day's popular music sung by Alan Dale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, and the Riddlers. The Phantom Voice is a puzzler, but some CBS listener will win five grand in cash. Now stay tuned for Von Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you laugh with Lucille Ball and my favorite husband on Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.